Well, another banger episode done of Astoria Wand and Sword. In this one, we will be going over episode 3. And generally, once again, I have overall pretty positive things to say about it. First of all here, I want to talk a bit about, you know, Elfie, Will, their connection, Scion, Rusty, and also magic items. I did quite enjoy the start of this episode where we get a bit of a longer flashback between Elfie and Will when Elfie is going to, to the tower to be a, a lander. And of course, they have their goodbyes and uh, the emotional moment there. But I like what they are showcasing with that scene. Not only the clear connection and uh, love that Will and Elfie have for each other, which has been so, so and apparent so far. But when Will turns around, you know, he's crying, he's in pain, obviously, but says to Professor Workner that you know, this will be the last time I cry and that I will be pathetic, signaling that, yes, from now on, I will do anything and everything and be strong and principled and determined beyond all doubt to rise to the occasion and climb the tower to be with my childhood friend and I suppose childhood love as well, to be fair. And I do like them just showcasing that and making it very clear that yes, Will is not fucking around. Like Will is serious about keeping his promise. And that just goes to further build on his character and uh, his motivations at this time in the story. Overall as well though, with the flashback and everything else really with the show so far, I keep being impressed with the, you know, the music choice, the direction or directing of the show, the cinematography, like the animation, like everything of this show just to me screams high quality. It screams high budget and a lot of care and love that's been put into making it. Just the small things like the newspaper being sort of Harry Potter-esque with the living images in the paper right on the page and everything else just really makes me appreciate all the work that's been put into making this world and putting it on screen in the way that it has been so far. Also though, I gotta say, Elfie, damn, made 12 unique spells, the most in history for any one Vander. I mean, that is, uh, that's our girl. Add a girl there, good job. I'm sure you'll come up with more in no time, especially as she is the youngest one as well on that uh, council, which we will get into later. I did also somewhat like the uh, Scion clip we got this episode, even though he wasn't really in the episode more than like 10 seconds. I do just love the tiny bit of time he was given when he's fighting these uh, ice golems, whatnot, to get the material for the uh, the quest, basically, that uh, Elfie put out to the academy that she needs for spells and whatnot. And just him clearly overpowering a ton of these ice golems to get this material, and of course his goons being, as always, very impressed by him. Oh, wow, Sugoi, good job. But him still anguishing over this, it's still not enough. I'm still weak. That is still nowhere near the power I saw that Will displayed in episode one when he was fighting that, uh, that monster to, uh, well, save his life. And I like that this might somewhat hint at a, uh, well, a growth arc in a way, where Scion might slowly start to respect Will in a way and try to work towards the same power level. Like, it, it will be a driving factor for him, like a really big determining driving factor for him to do everything he can to topple him. To show him that you know he's better, magic is better. But how it might, in the end, maybe, if they go that route, make the very trope, big class, big antagonist character that is Scion into more of a fleshed out, full-on character that might have more than just hate for Will. And, well, we'll have to see how that develops, if at all, over the course of the season. Just nice, though, again, to see them giving like a tiny bit of time to showing how he is doing. Another very small minor note I want to touch on is definitely the uh, exposition that this anime does because they keep putting in exposition in these class lessons, which I appreciate because again, just exposition where two characters talk to each other about things both of them should be well aware of just so the audience gets informed is bad writing. But here, talking about, you know, unique spells and whatnot in the sense of a class lesson, Yes, that makes sense. So again, just those small things I always do appreciate in anime, or any media for that matter. Also nice touch showing uh, the example of the Darbicus, whatever the dark magic that Edward used, and uh, showcasing the battle between Will and uh, Edward basically on the screen as an example of the, the spell. Like, yep, I remember that from last episode, I remember. Oh, and, and another thing. Will is absolutely buff as all hell. Like, holy Christ, Will is built different. Like, that body is like, he looks so thin. 
But once he takes off his shirt, he's like Hulk Hogan. God damn, how do you fit all those muscles in that frame when you have clothes on? Like, okay, clearly we have some uh, interesting physics at work here. But that again just goes to show his insane level of training and uh, effort, though, to be that buff. Because let me tell you, even in anime land, that's not easy. As Will is, you know, undressing though and changing clothes to go into the, to the dungeon to get this uh, crystal things for Elfie, we get introduced to magic gear. Which is interesting, because we see that Rosty, his uh, roommate here, who is a nice likable character so far, is an artisan of sorts and creates magic gear, I guess, as his job or his talent. And we also see Will using this magic gear to, to defeat this uh, Frost Rex monster at the end of the episode. But it got me wondering about magic gear in this world. So it's like, okay, what is really magic gear? Like, is that prevalent? Is it normal to have that in the world? Is that sort of like something most mages use or is it sort of not really something that is widely used and it's more of a special use case scenario and no one really uses it because it's not relevant to them when they have you know powerful magic i don't really know but i'm very interested to know more about magic items and how it is used in the world if really at all because i haven't seen anyone else having any magic items i think so far in the show so hopefully we will get more info on that moving forward to finish off my thoughts as well on the fight with the uh frost rex when will uses the uh the uh magic items i will say that yes you know the fight is good as all the other fights have been they were not as impressive or impactful to me as the fights in the previous two episodes though those were very very good so can't really easily overcome that and this wasn't like a big sort of story battle just like a an encounter really so i can't really expect it to overcome the the fights in episode one and two but i'm still happy that they had a fight scene here and it seems that every episode they want to have some sort of fairly well animated fight scene at least that's how it's been the first three episodes and uh, i mean i definitely don't mind that especially when it looks and is directed as it is in this show it's nice to see will using his uh, brains as well here not just hacking things to bits with his uh, sword but actually using tactics as iris as we get introduced to explains that hey you can't use your sword on this guy because he'll just freeze everything. And speaking of Iris, yes, she is coming up very soon. Before we get into more, though, on this episode, if you are liking the video, get any value out of it, then please remember to like and subscribe. It greatly helps out the channel, and I thank you deeply for the support, so thank you, thank you, if you choose to do so. So finally, in this episode, we get introduced to all, I think, the uh, Magia Vanders in the top of the tower, or at the top of the tower, and we get a lot of interesting information. First of all, we get introduced to the concept of factions in this episode. So Elfie clearly is in the Ice faction, and it seems that every Vander is of a different faction. Though, as we see when we get to the top of the tower and uh, Iris gives her report, there are only four Vanders, but five seats. So I suppose the last one is open, and inevitably, what, I'm sure Will is going to take that seat. Am I right? I mean, who else? But it is interesting that each of them seem to have a different element. So does that mean that there can only be one Vander in each faction? Or like each faction can only have like one sort of Magia Vander in like the top of the tower as that title? Or how does that work? I mean, there are more elements than five, right? Yeah, because you have Dark Element, for example, which wasn't on there at all. And we also get to know about Earth Element, which was not on there either. Or are the five seats just to signify that there are five Vanders, but only four were present, but there can be more? I don't really know. Yes, we will find out more later on that front. But the concept of factions interested me, because it seems that the classmates there, when we get introduced to uh, Colette and her friend, you know, chatting about how she uh, likes Will, it seems that people are choosing factions based on different things. So when these uh, pupils choose factions, is that, it's that, is that sort of like a membership thing? Like, uh, I'm choosing to be in the ice faction because of all the spells it has and whatnot, and the, like the popularity of it and the power of the spells and whatnot. Is that something you have to like sort of choose on like a, like a card? And do you get to change faction after you've gone into a faction? And can you only use spells from the specific faction you've chosen? Like if you're in the ice faction, are you allowed to use fire spells? Or is it just the fact that once you're in, let's say the ice faction, you only focus on mastering ice spells? Does it have some sort of de detrimental effects if you try to use spells from different elements or different factions? If you are, let's say, dedicated to one? I have no idea, but uh, the concept of factions I think are interesting and I want to definitely know more on that front later on. The Vanders, though, I find interesting so far. I mean, they seem to be a very 
eccentric bunch to say the least. The uh, elitist wind user, the very pragmatic uh, lightning, I suppose, user. That was the only one that didn't have anything against Will eventually just joining the upper tower. Except for Elfie, of course, though she didn't say anything during that exchange. And then the fire dude, which I guess is more of the, the leader of the group. Or the most uh, senior there. Anyhow, though, they seem very interesting and diverse. So uh, hopefully we will get a lot of fun interactions and uh, delving much more into their personalities and characters moving forward. Because they do seem like uh, interesting people, to say the least. Elfie included, of course. We do also get information during this, this exchange that the Vanders themselves say that if the fated day comes, which I guess is you know, when Doomsday come, and uh, once again the world will be set upon by the Miasma and the well, Calamity, basically, that they aren't strong enough. They are too weak, and they would lose. Period. So they need to find more powerful people, which I guess is why Iris did what she did. And then they talk about the Magic Festival, which I suppose we will get into next episode, based on the title of the next episode. And I suppose that will be somewhat of a tournament arc, or something along those lines, where Will will inevitably win, or at least do well. So he has a chance of, you know, getting attention, and then maybe getting into the upper echelons of the tower. So I guess it works as a sort of selection tool for the uh, advancement to the tower. So if it is a tournament arc, I mean, I'm fine with that. Let's do a few episodes, do a tournament arc, and uh, have some fun with that. And let Will showcase his skills to the greater world, or at least the ones that are very stuck up on magic, and uh, make him think twice. Another note I wanted to make, though, is that I do quite like how they just intersperse world building into each episode, just between different scenes, and how it all seems to flow very well together. For example, in this one, when they explain that, hey, this guy is just fake, which I thought... The sky wasn't fake. I mean, I knew it was a seal, but I thought the sky was the sky, but I guess the entire sky is just a fake, fake sky, and the miasma is actually above it, but can't get through. So that's interesting. It was nice to see Alfie's smile, though, when uh, she and Iris have this uh, short interchange at the end of the episode, where she says, uh, you know, she'll be waiting. She's a very, very cute wife, I have to say. And for anyone else, Iris or Colette included, that uh, tried to get our man uh, Will here, good luck. Because Elfie is, uh, Elfie's gonna win. Just gonna call it now. Not even gonna be a competition, alright? It does seem interesting, though, that while Iris was very respectful and, uh, showed a lot of deference and formality to the other Vanders before they left, she stood up and acted fairly familiar with Elfie when she was the only one left in the, uh, well, throne room, whatever you want to call it. So that makes me wonder, okay, did Elfie send Iris down there to check up on Will and see how good he actually was under the guise of finding talent? Like, are these two characters much closer than you would think on first, uh, first look? I'm not sure, but it seems that they have some sort of more familiar relationship than anyone else there. So hopefully we will get more info on that moving forward as well. Maybe, maybe she's more working for Elfie than any of the other ones. I guess we will have to see. Finally though, well, I want to talk a bit about Colette and definitely Iris. Because Iris was a bit of a surprise this episode. First of all, all Colette, even though the only thing to get this episode of Colette is her being, uh, what, I guess, chewed out by Rose, her classmate, for uh, being into Will when she seems jealous of Elfie. But uh, yeah, as I said, Colette, you have no shot. Just let it go. Let it go. I know he's attractive. I know he's buff as hell. But uh, no, you you can't get that boy. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. When we first get introduced to Iris as well, though, this episode, I thought she was just going to be more of an excuse for Will to, to save someone and... Uh, have a companion for this boss fight. And she seemed like a sort of cute-ish waifu character, you know, that was very sort of ditzy. But no, she was actually undercover. It's like, oh, okay. I was definitely surprised when she did the whole, uh, how will I report this uh, shtick at the end of the fight? It's like, oh, she is actually more than she seems. Did not see that one coming. All right. I do wonder what her position, though, is in the tower. Like, is she some sort of, like, middle tier. I mean, she's in the upper league, like, she's in the tower, but she's clearly, of course, under the Vanders. So I guess she is a watcher, as they sh say. So a watcher is a spy, I suppose? Something along those lines. And she was sent there to potentially l weed out talent to be watched out for, that the Vanders could use to strengthen their ranks before the inevitable calamity. Of course, when Iris says that, hey, you know, the no talent, no magician, no warrior, you know, he's, he's strong, you know, I would recommend he be admitted into the tower, and everyone is against it, except for the uh, more pragmatic, buff, uh, electric Vander guy. Because, well, I suppose they have a lot of uh, disdain for uh, non-magic users, and it goes against the, well, I suppose, entire point of being a 
Magia Vander when you don't have any magic. It will be interesting though to see how I suppose, I assume, Will will inevitably change the minds though of the other Vanders as they get to see him in action and how he will inevitably be used uh, for the uh, the fight against this calamity that will come at some point or other. Anyhow though, overall I enjoyed the episode as I've enjoyed the last two. I think this show is underrated even though I feel like people are talking about it. I feel like it should be talked about more because it isn't making a massive splash right now, I feel like, like some other shows like Alia or some others this season that are just blowing up in pop popularity. Vistoria is more of a sleeper hit that I feel will just get better with time, and once we get like another handful of episodes, I think a good portion of people will just really, really love it. I mean, I'm definitely very invested so far, and I really like the quality that each and every episode shows, and while I can only hope it keeps going the way it is, Anyhow though, what are your thoughts on episode 3 of Astoria Wand and Swore? Leave all those down below or any other thoughts or comments on my commentary or analysis in this video. With that being said, I hope you have a nice day, keep watching anime, and I will see you next time. So, bye bye